Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I'm David Simmons, and on tonight's show, I'm delighted to be joined by Scottish actor. We've got Mr. Gary Hollywood on the show. How are you, David? Nice to join you. Ah, uh, no, thanks for coming on, mate. I do appreciate your time. How's uh, how's how's life over in R- Lanzarote? That's where you're right now, isn't it? I can't complain. The sun is shining, so I could be in worse places, I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we'll come back to Lanzarote shortly, but I mean, how's the whole, whole how's the whole COVID situation been for you? I mean, I'm asking that question, but I do kind of know the answer. It's been a bit of a an up and down roller coaster, hasn't it? It has. It's been crazy for us all. Uh, fortunately for us here in Lanzarote, that we've got the weather and that we can get outside uh, compared to back home. Like my mum and dad and my, my family are in Glasgow, and it's just been a nightmare. Obviously, the weather doesn't help. Uh, Restrictions haven't been too strict uh, compared to the UK. So uh, so we've got away lightly, so to speak, uh, in comparison to to back home. Yeah, I mean, you welcomed a child into the world during lockdown as well, didn't you? We did. Yeah, lockdown baby. And uh, we came back to Glasgow uh, to have Ollie. And uh, we thought that was always a plan, come back have Ollie, let the family see him, and then we'll head back to Lanzarote. Well, six months later, <laughs> stuck with my mum and dad. We were staying with my mum and dad, which is great. Love them dearly, but six months. Yeah, that's it, because, um, I mean, obviously the flights were all grounded, wasn't it? I take it that yeah. was the reason for your longer stay over in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, the, the flights just came to a halt. And then obviously the Spanish government, the Canary government, went letting any tourists in. Uh, and uh, that was it. We just sort of said, right, we have to go with it. Fortunately, having a baby kept us very well occupied and busy. And uh, and it was a wee godsend, I suppose, because he kept our minds, uh, he kept us, you know, our minds in other places and, and kept us all busy. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take you right back then, Gary. Uh, we're yeah. going to go back to 1993, age 12. You were sent for an audition uh, to Taggart. I mean, was yeah. that your first taste of the acting environment? It was. Uh, it was a call came through to my, my drama teacher and uh, it was basically they were going around uh, primary schools in Glasgow and two kids from every drama department were to go uh, to audition for Taggart. The the other side of the coin was it was to be blonde headed kids, and of course I've certainly not dyed my hair, so I was only ginger scent. So there we go, me and my mum on the forty bus to Cow Cadens from Pollock. Uh, and Do you think that's the... what made you stand out? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> uh, and there was like with fifty other kids, and I was only ginger. Um, and obviously felt alienated uh, as I was sitting there with the rest of the kids. Uh, that was it. I got the audition and then I got a recall. And uh, as they say, we never looked back. That was me. I got the bug uh, for acting and then the journey went from there. I said, I mean, there's been a murder. Taggart was a there's huge show, a wasn't murder. it? It was massive. And I grew up with it as well and so did my family. So this was, you know, this was really getting a gold cup. Yeah, I mean, were you the legend back at high school? Because you were only in first year at the time, did all the other... Only in first the- year, and oh, everybody was brilliant, you know. Everybody was so proud and so supportive. And uh, it was great fun and uh, lo- loved loved my, my time with uh, with Taggart. And obviously Mark McManus when he, when he was alive, God rest him. And uh, and so that was it. I led from, from Taggart and then a year later I got a part in Dr. Finlay and then I got an agent. And then I got a call into to High Road, which took me into nine years in soap opera. Uh, yeah, again, I mean, one of my mommy's favourites. So this was it, you know. I was a, yeah. I was a golden child for a while. That's it. I mean, it was, was it Dominic Dunbar you played in Take That's the High right. Road? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've filmed on the Bonnie Banks a lot. Lomond, what was your memories of that era? Brilliant. Loved it, you know. And uh, because I was under 16 at the time, I had to have a chaperone. So I, I was managed to to wangle my mum in to get a job as well. Uh, and it was brilliant, yeah. We would spend two days a week there in location doing doing the soap and then the remainder of the week done in the studio. Uh, and it was uh, just an experience. And, and very, you know, people give soap a hard time, but I tell you, it really teaches you so much, especially discipline and learning scripts in time, turning up in time uh, and 15 hour, you know, filming days. So it really taught us a lot about about the industry. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I want to take you um, on a on a journey as well. Which you, you covered um, the the boyhood of John Muir, where you played John Muir. Now, I've got quite an interest in this one because he was born in Dunbar, which is not too yeah. far from where I'm based. Yeah. Um, now, for those that don't know a lot about John Muir, he was involved a huge part in establishing national parks over in America. He had meetings with the likes of President Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. I mean, did you have to do a lot of research for playing the role of John Muir? Yeah, you know, like, shameful that when we're at school, we learn all about history and, and all sorts of history, World War I, World War II, and, and the French Revolution, all these things. And I never, ever heard of John Muir until we started researching on the movie. Uh, and he was huge and a huge icon in America for Yosemite National Park and a great conservationist. And I went to his little house, there's a museum there, and I'm, I'm not too sure if it's still there, but I went to Dunbar. And yep, was I, a, a, I think it is, I think it's on the main street. Uh -huh. I'm sure STV did a, right. a, a piece on it, yeah. And uh, so off there and uh, met everyone that was involved with the trust and did all the research and again, Exciting because this was going to be filmed in, in Boston, Massachusetts, at 16 years of age at the time, had never been abroad, never been past Largs or Troon. That was the holidays in Millport. So this, to go on a plane, was, was, was exciting stuff. And again, I wrote my mum into it and I said, you know, do you fancy coming and, and chaperoning me? And I said, we're only going for three weeks. As it turned out, when I was on the plane, I told her that it was five weeks we were going for. Well, I, you can imagine I got a belt around the ear for lying to her. And how was my dad going to cope without us? But uh, off we went and we had five, five fantastic weeks, uh, just, you know, 16 years of age in Boston, you know, doing my first major movie. Yeah, I mean, you've also done some work with the famous Alan Rickman as well, haven't you? God dressed him, yeah. And that was the same year. I flew back from Boston after doing the, the, the movie with John Muir and I got a phone call to say that Mr Rickman would like to see me uh, at the Scottish Youth Theatre in Glasgow. Alan Rickman wants to see you know see me and uh, it was to go in audition for, for the part of Alex and the Winter Guest. And so off we went. And of course, he was just taking the He's taking the proverbial out of me because I just jetted in from, from Boston, Massachusetts. And, and yeah, here I am. So he was like taking the mickey and saying, oh, I'm glad you could fit me in in your schedule and things like that. And uh, we got the movie of uh, The Winter Guest along with Emma Thompson and her mother, Phyllida Law. Great actress, uh, Sandra Vaux and Sheila Reed, who most would know Sheila from the Benidorm. She yep. played Madge. So it was a great cast. 12 weeks in the East Coast and Creef and uh, Pitt and Weem and uh, an area that I, you know, we didn't frequent as a child. So I really got to know that area. Of course, it was absolutely freezing cold because it was done in October. So you can imagine the temperatures in Scotland then. But uh, yeah, you know, the idea that Alan Rickman, Emma Thompson, Phyllis DeLoss, Sheila Reid, Sandra, it was just, it was phenomenal and, uh, and a great experience. And uh, again, another rung in the ladder towards... Uh, Feature feature films. Yeah, I mean other feature films you've you've been in as well. I mean you played a copper in the movie Neds. That's that's quite a hardy movie, that isn't it? Oh, it was a tough movie. And when Peter Mullen had gave me the call and he said, I'm sorry, he said, uh, there's a small part if you fancy it. It's nothing too big, but it's yours if you fancy it. And I said, Am I you know, can I not play a Ned? And he said, No, you're far too old for that now. <laughs> and uh, and again, you know, when Peter Mullen phones you and says he wants you in your movie, then you don't think twice. Uh, and it was it, it was a great experience, good a, a good time as well. And again, all filmed in, in an area that I grew up with. It was in Carmodric and Arden, and I, you know, originally from Pollock. So it was all in an area that I sort of went around uh, as a young Ned. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, you played a copper in that. You also, like we said, you're in Taggart as well. I mean, do my research to this. You've said in other interviews you wanted to be a traffic cop when you grew up. Well, that was that. Well done. Well, well researched. Yeah, people would say, did you always want to be an actor? And I said, no. I said, uh, I always fancied being a copper. And they said, yeah, a copper. I said, yeah. And again, like a young kid. I said, yeah, a copper. I said, a traffic cop because then I could, you know, jump about in a big, fancy, powerful car and not get done for speeding. <laughs> in, in all seriousness, do you think that would have been a route you might have went down if you hadn't got into acting? Or I think so. I, I, I think either that or law or uh, or uh, poli politics, you know, as a, an MP. I'm a great... I would like to think that 
I'm a carer and a, and a giver and, a, and, a, and I don't like injustice. So I think with those sort of uh, fields, that, that, that was something that I was thinking of. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in recent times, we know you for Dino Doyle and Mrs. Brown's boys. Well, well, how did you, it, you know? Yeah, how did you first get involved with, with Brendan O'Carroll? Well, it was back in 2000 and I was doing a panto at the Glasgow Pavilion and Brendan and part of his team were, were, were over. Brendan was just relatively coming into the UK and the, and the, the circuit there with, uh, with uh, Mrs. Brown. Uh, we were doing 99 shows. Uh, after that, he said, what you what you doing? And I was heading, the bill was still going on at the time, and I, I had a couple of meetings uh, with the possibility of getting into that. And uh, and he said, well, I've written this play, and there's a part if you fancy it. And I had to juggle, you know, thinking, well, where, where's the play going to go, or do I go for the bill? And I had young kids at the time. So obviously, you know, we needed the money, and it was to support them. But I, I, I took the chance, and and aren't I glad that I took the chance? <laughs> Twenty years later, uh, we've, we've had a great time, and uh, glad to say that I was part of the the success and the the awards and the achievements that that has picked up along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, you've been involved for like, what, 20 years with that show. Yeah. I mean, it was very much a family feel about it. Obviously, there's a lot of the O'Carrolls in it. Did you feel like you maybe you grew up with that family? Well, that's it. Like, we all grew up together. We all went through engagements and weddings, our children, some divorces, some not. So we've all grew up together uh, along the way. So I was, what, 21 when I met Brendan and Danny, his son, was 18. Um so we're a lot a, a lot younger then and yeah as you say certainly grew up uh knowing everyone very well yeah i mean you, you mentioned that you met, met brendan in the panto scene i mean yeah. even mrs brown's boys it does have a bit of a panto feel to it doesn't it it's, a, oh, it's yeah, different from other sure. sitcoms for sure and that that was different it had the slapstick of panto around it and brendan would always break down especially when we moved into tv he would break down the fourth wall giving it that panto feeling uh, and some of the jokes and, and and the costumes and the hilarity um and I, I you know i certainly think that's what most people enjoyed as well there was nothing yeah. serious about it it was you know when it hit tv it was switch on for half an hour uh, switch on your, your channel, switch off from what's happening in your life and just have a bit of fun. Yeah, I believe it says it warts and all. Was, was yeah. all, Like you say, if someone made a mistake on their lines, Brendan would pick up on it. Do you think that was a, a contribution as to why the show was so successful? I think so. And also, you know, uh, if anybody fluffed their lines, he, he actually went out his way to make sure that, he, you know, he would try and put you off. Your lines, they would try and make you corpse, they would try and make you forget your lines and add things in that you had no idea that was coming and that's what he thrived on. And I think that that's what transfer, you know, transferred over when we went into the TV side of things. Yeah, I mean, you toured the world with the show. Uh, did you expect Mrs Brown's boys to reach the heights that it did? No, I, I knew there was something special about it and, and Brendan was always adamant that this was going places. And uh, when you're in the, the acting industry, you hear that, you know, every, every day, uh, you hear it coming from a lot of people. So we sort of just, you know, took it in our stride. But I knew there was something uh, special. I didn't realise it, it would go that big. You know, we've toured Canada, we toured, you know, three, four months in Australia, we've done New Zealand, uh, you know, selling out the, the O2 in London for, you know, four nights, 20,000 people a night. Moving into arenas, you know, the Glasgow Hydro, and moving over uh, to to Dublin, and doing all the all the big venues. I never ever thought it would be that big. Yeah, I mean, you touched on there, obviously, the, the world tours that you went on. I mean, another huge success was winning the likes of the NTA's, BAFTA's, TV Choice Awards. How um, how important is it to get this recognition for all the hard work that goes into these shows? Oh, you know, like anybody in the business, they're looking for the award. They really are, and and. For me, growing up, watching Bastards, watching all these big celebrities in the NTAs, you know, I was like a kid in a Swedish shop. I, I was just starstruck with everybody and desperate to go up and ask people for their pictures, a bit shy, but a uh, couple of glasses of champagne in you later and it was, uh, hello, Hugh Bonneville, can I get your, your, fo your photo? And Paula Grady and all these people that I've watched all over the years. Uh, and, and yeah, certainly, certainly starstruck. But great that, that it got the recognition, uh, that we were all part of it, we all contributed to it. Uh, and then we go back to Scotland and we picked up the Scottish BAFTA. But again, you know, my hometown, being able to get in the kilt, 
and 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 go with your peers, people that you've grew up with, and uh, and seeing them, you know, on the night whilst you're picking up awards. Okay, you know, a dream come true from from a wee boy from Pollock. Absolutely, and I, I bet there was a good few after parties as well. Oh, there was, yes, yes, there was. <laughs> well, I remember anyway. <laughs> no, it, it was great fun. It was great fun. Now, I mean, a bit more serious. I mean, just to clear things up, Gary, I mean, I interviewed a quite a high-ranked politician recently who said that they like doing these sort of interviews because what they say comes from the horse's mouth. There's no yeah. twist in it. There's no writing it on paper and newspapers mucking about and taking their words out of context. So you're obviously no longer part of Mrs Brown's Boys. Can you clear up exactly what happened? How did it all come to an end? Well, there's a, there's a lot of o o ongoing uh, legal right. things oh, at right. the moment. So I need to I need to be careful what I say, but yeah, the, 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 there's been a dispute uh, with myself and Brendan and and you know production companies out with, uh, and hopefully in time uh, through advice and, and and legalities that this will be sorted out, uh, and that we'll we'll get to move on. Uh, sadly for me, that it's ended uh, abruptly, uh, as as it has. Uh, especially being with them for 20 years and, and you know, thinking uh, that, that, that these people have been part of your life uh, and went through all your ups and downs. So sad, very sad in that, that it's, it's come to, to an abrupt end. Uh, and in time, all will be revealed and, and what the, the fallout and, and the dispute and the disagreements have been about. Yeah, I mean, as we touched on earlier, uh, Gary, you're over in Lanzarote. That's been seven years now. Um, what what made you leave rainy Scotland <laughs> for Lanzarote, mate? <laughs> you know, I, I love when I get asked this, and as you say, you know, you 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 just speak from the heart. So it was a divorce that brought me to uh, right. to Lanzarote, and uh, I separated from from my wife at the time, and I came here on holiday, fell in love with the place, and I was heading to Australia with Mrs. Brown on tour. And I said to my partner, when I come back, we're moving to Lanzarote. And, uh, you know, thinking, yeah, whatever. And I booked all the flights and four cases each on a Ryanair flight from Glasgow. And uh, there we go. Uh, coming up for eight years in May, uh, we started a new life. And uh, now a little boy who turned a year last week and uh, yeah and two years into to a new marriage so yes yeah, it's, it's it's been it's certainly not been quiet that's for sure fantastic <laughs> i mean it, it's it's playa blanca isn't it because yes, i've been on holiday there i've stayed in playa blanca there maybe what 15 years ago beautiful place isn't it it's lovely and uh, i like what i liked about playa blanca it was it wasn't too commercialized when we got here uh Puerto de Carmen is where all the nightlife is. So to live here is perfect. And if you want a night out, then you can head through to the to the busier uh, tourist resorts. But uh, no, loved it. And uh, certainly next time you're over, give me a shout and I'll take you for a few drinks. Absolutely. Hopefully that Irish bar's still there on the coast, is it? It's still right on the water. There was a, I lived there for two weeks. Yes. That I uh, Irish bar. It was Molly's. Uh, it's now changed hands. It's now called the Ocean. But I did become very close friends with uh, Gwen and Des that own Molly's Bar. So yeah, they've uh, leased their place out to this new, but uh, this this new chain. But it's uh, still there. And just like you, when I moved here, I spent three weeks of that holiday in the very same bar. <laughs> there we go. Small world, mate. <laughs> very small world. Um, how how's the whole COVID situation affected sort of life over in Lanzarote? Is there? I take it obviously there's no tourists coming. How's that affected? No. It's, it's, it's sad. It's, it's sad to watch. Uh, thankfully, we don't have a business because when we did move here, that was one of the thoughts that let's. I was thinking of an entertainment bar and bringing over, you know, acts from the UK uh, because I felt it just it lacked, you know, a different entertainment. The entertaining here is very repetitive. It's fine for tourists, but when you're a resident, you, you're seeing the same acts week in and week out. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the ideas. Thankfully, we never went with it simply because now that I'm watching what's happening to all these small businesses and bars and restaurants, they are struggling. They're struggling so, so hard. It's so sad. I've seen so so many big bars uh, that you thought, you know, there's no way they're going anywhere, and they've closed. Uh, small restaurants are closed. Small bars are closed. They're really struggling. They, they desperately need the tourists back. They really yeah. do. You know, we went and walked down by the, the sea the other morning and it was just dead. 
uh, and people, this is their livelihood, livelihood and they're just struggling. So I'm hoping uh, that, you know, maybe August, September time that yeah. things will, will open up for them. But uh, but thankfully, yeah, you know, I, I really feel for, for the businesses and thankfully we don't, we don't have that worry. But it, it really is like a ghost town. It really is. It's sad to see. Yeah, I mean, it must be weird not having the hustle and bustle of the tourists walking yeah. the streets. Yeah, yeah. No, I get and, that. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, there's a side where you enjoy that, where we're not having to book tables for for a restaurant, so you're not having to squeeze into a bar. But you know, when you take that aside, I do miss the town being busy. I do yeah. miss the hustle and bustle. Yeah, on Sunday afternoons, um, you present on ninety three point three Monster Radio in Lanzarote. Yeah. Um, do you enjoy doing the radio shows? Love it. And, you know, that just fell in my lap. I, I was doing uh, an interview at the station for AJ, uh, who I now is now the radio wife, and she's partnered up with me to, to do the show. And I was just doing an interview similar to this on the air. And afterwards, she said, you know, you really should come and do your own show. And I said, oh, well, you know, we're busy doing Mrs. Brown. I'm heading back to, to Glasgow. And, and the diary just didn't work. And uh, and so when when we came back after Ollie, that's when I said, okay. They said, you know, come in, let's let's do it. And uh, they said, you fancy doing it on your own? And I said, no, I fancy uh, with AJ, and we'll do a, a, a the duo, the double dunter. And uh, and I, I've loved it. And again, I'm learning a lot from it. Uh, there's a lot involved. I really, take my hat off now to to the the radio host. Now that I realise what's involved with with doing it. Uh, but loving it, uh, and just just in Sunday past, we had the lovely Elaine C. Smith uh, joined us, and we had a great chat with her. And we've had Anthony Costa from Blue and Lee Brennan, uh, 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 Kyle Tomlinson from X Factor, Sam Bailey. We've had some really really good guests, and it's great that through myself and through my contacts, I can get these people on the station so that the you know that the, the island. Uh, Lanzarote, the Canaries and Fuerte Matura can, can hear these guys and also listen to on the radio garden at Worldwide. We've got people in California, uh, people in Texas, people in Rome. and uh, So it's, it's been great when they're all messaging in, telling us that they're tuning in. Yeah, I mean, have you worked with Elaine in the past? I, I've, I've known Elaine uh, socially and as a friend, but we've never, ever shared the stage together. Really? Uh, so that would be something I'd like to do. Uh, hopefully in the future but uh, it was just lovely uh, to get her because as I say she, she doesn't really do a lot of interviews so uh, I, I sort of used the friendship card and said oh please come on you know the radio station and the listeners would love to have you on yeah no it's nice you've not forgot your friends over here in the rain that's for sure <laughs> no no not at all <laughs> Uh, is radio is radio a line of work that you might see yourself going down, Gary, more full time? Or certainly got a taste for it. It's funny mm. to say. I, it's addictive, isn't it, mate? I, I, <laughs> I, I is. I've certainly got a taste, and I said to my manager, I said, I fancy more of this. I really do. Uh, so who knows? Who knows what the what the future holds? But yeah, I've certainly got the bug for it, uh, and just just been able to. I think if I was to do something, I think it would be what I'm doing just now is to to do an interviewing people and. Uh, chatting away, I enjoy that. Uh, but yeah, certainly, certainly something that I'd like to do more of. Uh, another one of your friends who's actually been on the Salt and Sauce show with myself ah. um, here in Scotland is Libby Emerson. Um, she's oh, CEO Libby. CEO of Mental Health Charity Back On Side. In case those that don't know, I mean you're a patron of her charity, aren't I you? Yes. I mean the work the work Libby does is amazing, isn't it? She is exceptional, and I've sort of been a patron with every charity that Libby's done. Uh, I don't know who's stalking who, but. <laughs> Certainly a big, big supporter. You know, she's certainly part of her family. She's like a sister that I, I never had. Uh, and I support her 100%. And what she's done with that charity is exceptional. From day one, where, you know, nobody knew about it, nobody wanted to involve with it, the amount of doors and hurdles that she has had to knock and jump over uh, to get where, where it is just now is phenomenal. You know, and I've had her over here. She's been in holiday here as well. And... Uh, you know, she came here for two weeks and I think she had one day where she didn't, you know, open that laptop up. She's constantly, constantly, constantly working for the charity. And I'm in awe of her uh, in such respect and uh, and really, really uh, proud, absolutely humbled that I'm involved, that I was asked to be patron. Um, and I really, you know, can't 
just I can't go over just how much she has done to get that charity out there and the results that she's created and obviously the lives that she has saved yeah. through that charity is it's it's phenomenal. It really is. And uh, I would urge anybody that you know that's watching us or, or listening to this is to you know please get behind back on side. Uh, it really is a special charity. The thing is as well, obviously, mental health's right at the forefront of every conversation at the moment. Um, if anyone is experiencing any mental health issues, I mean, Libby is so approachable, isn't she? Oh, she is, you know, and uh, you, you touched on earlier about with the Mrs Brown and, and you know, the drama and, and, and the, the fiasco that, that was going through Christmas and New Year. And I actually turned to myself, I have no shame mm. in, in saying that. And I said, you know, I, I think I might have to just chat to someone because I was going through all this and then I'd lost my brother last year. We had a little baby. Then I was going through, I'm going through all this turmoil with, 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 with all that nonsense with work. And I really was not a good place. And I just picked up the phone and uh, instantly I was, uh, someone, you know, was on the phone speaking to me. Yeah. Uh, and that's how, how quick and dedicated she is. Yeah. I mean, and then I take it a lot of that pressure was lifted once you do open up and you share that, isn't it? Oh, well, that's it. You know, I'm keeping it all into my, you know, myself. I'm not sharing that. I'm trying to keep it away from my wife. Uh, you know, we've got the wee baby. We're trying to focus on times are good and, and looking after him. But I knew that just deep down, that, you know, there's a, there's a dark cloud over me. Uh, so I'm dealing with all that just now. And, uh, and again, thanks to Back Inside. Yeah, no, absolutely. One thing we need to talk about, Gary, is you've created your own gin. It's called ah. Hollywood Gin G. <laughs> well, that's it. Uh, again, the ginge tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, Christ, uh, the, the years that I've been, you know, uh, taking the mick out of with, the, with having the ginger hair, uh, going through nursery, primary, you know, the usual ginger jokes and all this carry on. So I thought I have to have that carry, have to carry that on to the gin. So, yeah, the, the gin, in fact, Libby, as we were talking about, she was one of the friends we'd been talking about it for a couple of years. And she said, you need to do this. Uh, oh, well, you know, again, one day, one day. And yeah, one day I woke up and said to my wife, right, let's do this. And she said, let's oh, yeah. do what? I said, we're going for this gin. Let's get this gin sorted. We've spoken about it long enough. What are we going to call it? I said, Hollywood Ginge. <laughs> oh, God, right, okay. And then I got in tow with a contact in, in Leicestershire and the distillery there, Graham. And uh, he said, yeah, come on, let's let's get together and we'll do this for you. And off we went to gin school. Oh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> and Cheryl Ann was pregnant at the time, so she couldn't do any of the tastings. But what she was great for was the smell, because being pregnant, you know, that's the, 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 the sense of smell is really strong. So she, she was really good in, in orchestrating what botanicals we should be using and things like that. So we spent uh, two days at gin school. Finally, I, you know, I was saying, oh, maybe we'll go another third day to get this right. <laughs> uh, any excuse for a party. But uh, so we, we got that. We, we decided on the botanicals and off we went. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so we then started on design for the labels and what sort of design I wanted for the bottle. Yeah. And um, we were all, sorry? No, I was just going to say, were you a big gin drinker before you yes, decided to do this? Yes, Oh, yeah, anybody knows me then, they know that I love my gin. And, uh, and I, I didn't realise until I started going through the process of our own, I thought I drank every gin. There's <laughs> thousands, thousands of gin out there. So I must try harder. But uh, so, yeah, off we go. And then we, you know, we, we get the gin sorted and then we have to go into the design side. That taken a wee bit longer with me uh, being so pernickety regards the labels. And obviously I drove the team up the wall with, with definitely getting this label right. And I wanted it, I wanted it orange, the label orange on black uh, to keep in, you know, the toe with the gin theme. Uh, and of course we were trying to get, you know, the colour would come back and no, it wouldn't be, it was too orange or it wasn't orange enough. Uh, so that we'd taken our time with that and then COVID came. So we then had to, you know, take a foot off the pedal, so to speak, and, and spend a couple of months with nothing happening because the distilleries had to close down and printers were closing down, bottle manufacturers were closing down. 
And then we came out of that, and I was in Glasgow at the time, and I said to, to Graham at the distillery, we need to get this, this going because we have a small team that's focused on our gin, and everybody's been working hard, and it's coming up for Christmas. Everybody needs some money. So I said, we need to get this out. We have, we've missed all the targets for this year. We'll try and get the Christmas market yeah. uh, and try and, you know, so that the team can have some, some money in their pocket. So against, you know, all advice from marketing and all, all the big wigs, uh, well, really the big, the, the ones that know what they're doing. And then there's me saying, no, 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 we'll just get it out there. Uh, so I stood my ground. We got it out. Uh, thankfully, it was received very well. Sales went through the roof for Christmas. Uh, we, we captured the Christmas market. Everybody captured the tongue-in-cheek with the Hollywood ginge. Uh, and they went with it. And it's been fantastic. And uh, and so that's, that's it on its way. Uh, the gin, that's, that's it all in its way. Now we're looking at, uh, with the distribution side and getting it out there, yeah, that's my next question. I was going to say, what's the big plan for the gin? Is it to supermarkets? Is it bars? Is it the whole lot? Well, I, I'm looking at some nice restaurants in London. There's two restaurants that I'm in talks with at the moment. I'd love to tell you who they are, but I don't want to jinx it. And then I don't know if their marketing team will be saying, all right, well, we're not taking it because he's jumped the gun. <laughs> we haven't gave the go-ahead yet for him to say that. But I'm looking at the two in London, and if I get them, then I'd be super, super pleased. And then I would let, look into my homeland, uh, and I, I'd like to reach out to, to you know, to Glasgow. Uh, and I love the uh, the wee Jimmy that's got the lychee Oriental there in Glasgow as well, and. Uh, I'd like to reach out and see if he would maybe stock it and put it onto his menu uh, and maybe a couple of other bars in Glasgow. You know, I'd, I'd love to see it up there. You know, I just love to see and go, oh, that's, that's what we did. You know, that's what we've done. And then, and then, of course, if I do that and then they're charging me the price that they're going to charge me, and I'll go, oh, wait a minute, that's some profit you're making. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I'd love to do that. So that's, that's what I'm working on just now is, is to get it out there. Uh, regards super. Again, you know, it's, this is, I'm all new to this. Uh, so, you know, I'm learning every day and I'm actually, you know, knocking doors myself and, and making phone calls myself uh, because it's a new field that I'm not aware of. Uh, so, yeah, I'm finding that interesting. It's certainly not easy and I knew it was, wasn't going to be easy. I knew the easy part was doing the gin. That's the easy part. Yeah. Uh, but now it's, it's to get it out there. And uh, so the plan is that once I get it out there and if I get into these establishments, then the next stage that, I, that I'm doing is, is uh, a vodka. Oh, wow. And I'm doing, uh, and I'm hoping that I'd like to, uh, to be getting that out for hopefully summertime. So again, driving them up the wall because we're now going back to the label design. Yeah, I mean, so, you you, t you touched on with the gin, the, the botanicals yeah. that went into it. So you've got, like, say, the dandelion, elderberries, and you've incorporated ginger as well in the gin. We've got is ginger that, in there, yeah. Is that something that you're maybe looking to do with the vodka as well? Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'll, if I'll maybe I'll go orange. Right. Uh, and See I'd what you've like done there. To keep in, in, yeah, yeah. I'd <laughs> like to keep in that theme. Uh, I'd like to keep in the old orange ginger theme. And... Uh, so, yeah, I, I, again, I, until I get back in with the distillery and then, oh, God, I'll have to spend two days now doing the vodka tasting. <laughs> I mean, this is a bit, that'll be hard. But uh, so until I get in there, then we'll find out uh, what, what, what's the best taste. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. And then for the end of the year, I'd like to do a rum for Christmas. Well, you don't so, hold back, Gary. If you go with someone, you really go for it, mate, well, don't you? Well, that's it. I was thinking, right, that's it. The ball's rolling. Of course, just drive everybody up the wall because they're going, well, you know, let's get that and let's focus on this. And I'm going, right, okay, the next stage, the next stage. And, I, you know, I know myself, right, slow down, Gary, we'll get there. But I think it's been good. I, I, I think, what, well, whether it's helped or whether it's been, been the downside is, is obviously with uh, COVID happening and restrictions happening, not so much in Lanzarote, but been having more time in our hands it's gave us more time to think and more time to plan don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing i'd need to ask the team they're probably saying no no it's a bad thing because you put too much time in your hands but uh, but no i'm you know excited something different 
this was just a, an idea, as I said, sat with Libby Emerson many times, various other friends, and it was just on the bucket list. I said, I, I would love to do more in gin, you know, and people would say, well, you drink enough of it, so you should. And uh, and so that, that, that was it. it. It was just just one of those wee things, a wee dream has, has come true. Absolutely superb. I mean, where can we where can we purchase a bottle? Like you say, the gin's available now. Where can Joe Public go and get a get a bottle? Well, it's yeah, it's online sales at the moment, and uh, on Instagram it's Hollywood Gin, and the the link is on there. The link's also in my own Instagram, which is Mister Gary Hollywood, and also on Twitter uh, it's Gin Hollywood, and all the links are there. Will take you straight to the distillery, and uh, yeah, please uh, anybody listening. Buy a bottle, send me the picture, let me know what you think, and uh, and enjoy. Hopefully, oh no, I need to get on and get a get a bottle myself. My birthday's coming up, so if the wife's watching this, then oh, there you go, she can, she, she can sort me right out. <laughs> Gary, I look forward to seeing this in all the supermarkets, every bar, very shortly oh, in the future. Please God, please God. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Gary Hollywood. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. God bless. Thank you.